You will have heard us use a certain uh, number of words, uh, and you will therefore realize that the space, already a word in itself, no, the space, as opposed to a space, the space is um, defined as much by its terminology as it is by its technology. And to, so to help us kind of navigate through uh, the minefield of, uh, of meanings, uh, also mismeanings, misunderstandings, um, but also the way in which language is uh, a fundamental architecture of the hyperstition of reality, right? Um, we're going to have uh, a, an interlude by the great Dorian uh, Batkia. Dorian is a, uh, a, a journalist, a writer, curator, a, a crypto scumbag. Um, he's, uh, he's based between Europe and Dubai. He's been active in the crypto and NFT space since 2017 when he co-founded Kineticoin. And since 2021, he's been working to bring socially engaged art to the blockchain via SP. SK. Uh, he writes regularly amongst other places for Coindesk, Decrypt, Artnet News, and the Art Newspaper, where he covers the trials, tribulations, and the LOLs of the art market. Will you please give a warm welcome to Dorian Batkia? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks, Shuman. I'm a bit nervous, but uh, Shuman, if you can stay up here, I'm a bit nervous. I need daddy here. You want me to stay, <laughs> you want to stay here? Yeah. Um, all right. So, all right. Hype, scarce, scarcity, supply and demand, rug pulls, wash trading, pump and dumps. Well, in the bridge glossary of uh, what makes NFTs go burr, I suppose depends on like everything else in the art market on, well, what the last sucker is willing to pay. Um, who among us have, hasn't encountered a, a pitiless, dead-eyed crypto skeptic proclaiming with a straight face that the bubble bursting is near? gleefully turning the game of everyday life into an, an Olympics of cursed cancellations, an online quest of allyship into a quest for identitarian brownie points. Well, I mean, here we are. Uh, the terms and glossary of this new market may be useful consider, to consider, but rather than reading through the list, I got this uh, thing here. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, I'm not going to read through this list. It's pretty boring. I'll just kind of randomly click away. Uh, uh, I tend to begin a lot of uh, writing and also speaking about NFTs by looking at art history. Uh, the so-called gold rush of the NFT market has been parabolic over the last year. Yesterday, in fact, marked the one-year anniversary of the sale of Beeple's Every Days. Today, NFTs now account for 16% of the total art market. And I think it's genuinely useful to look at what artists in the past may have to say about movements in the present. Um, so perhaps it, it makes sense to start with an interesting anecdote about the German artist Albrecht Dürer. Dürer was a prolific and legendary artist known for crafting intricately designed prints and engravings that went on to influence the likes of Raphael and Titian. Uh, though he started as a painter, he soon realized the power of an emerging technology, printmaking. He once wrote to a friend, my picture is well finished and finely colored, Shiza. I have got little to profit by it. I could have earned 200 ducats in the time. I shall stick to engraving, and if I had done so before today, I would be a richer man by 1,000 florins. <laughs> Durer was envisaging a future in which new methods and avenues for monetizing art were becoming accessible. The truth is that art and money have always been uneasy bedfellows. Durer also became the first artist to litigate on the basis of having his intellectual property violated. In an open letter he wrote to a colleague, he said of would-be plagiarists, hold, Shiza, you crafty ones, strangers to work, and pilferers of other men's brains. Think not rashly to lay your thievish hands upon my works. Beware, know you that not I have a grant from the most glorious Emperor Maximilian, that not one throughout the imperial dominion shall be allowed to print or sell fictitious imitations of these engravings. Listen, and bear in mind that if you do, throw, do so, through spite or through covetousness. Not only will your goods be confiscated, but your bodies also be placed in mortal danger. Well, I gather Dura would not be a fan of the many derivative NFT projects sold on OpenSea, but that brings me to another point, that NFTs are a sales mechanism, not a medium. 
Durer was a magnificent artist who employed the tools at his disposable, disposal to make art accessible to a broader population. In a recent article in the art newspaper by Christian Paul, an adjunct curator of digital art at the Whitney Museum and a professor of media studies at the New School, she said that the boom bust cycle of NFTs miscalculate the history of digital art by convoluting it with blockchain t technology. And I quote Paul, the term NFT art suggests it describes a medium like video or performance art, but the vast majority of so-called NFT art uses non-fungible tokens as a sales mechanism, not a medium, end quote. Noting how the NFT gold rush has been driven by wild speculative investments in digital assets rather than a unique medium or even genre, this brings me to another point, that while the pendulum of the art market may appear to be shifting, the role in... The role of NFTs in the hallowed halls of museums remains still anything but certain. A big part of this may have to do with the eye-watering sums paid, paid for NFTs is due to the explosion of the crypto market. So pivoting from, let's say, the terminology used, whether it's rug pulls, pump and dumps, scams, rarities, public keys, private keys, peer-to-peer, -peer, and so on, the, the fact is that just prior to 2022, the total market cap of cryptocurrencies was at $3 trillion. Uh, well, the total market cap of all NFTs sold up until that point was $6.1 billion. That means that the money being poured into NFTs form only a fraction of the total of crypto in circulation. Now, a big part of the terminology used around the, the cultural, let's say, ethos of NFTs and crypto art and blockchain tends to formulate around bubble trouble and spending and, and wild speculative nature of crypto as a whole. And I think it's also useful to look at another historical anecdote when we talk about the terminology used to, to wade our way through this swamp. And that would be uh, that crypto as a whole, many investors are investing in different, different cryptos such as Ethereum and Solana. And it's important to say that there is a historical precedence for what is happening in terms of the market cap and the bubble of cryptos. So let's go back to last year. And within 12 days of the aforementioned Beeple sale last year, the every days, the Emirati-based artist Sasha Jeffrey also achieved global recognition by becoming the fourth pay, highest paid living artist after selling a 17,000 square foot canvas called The Journey of Humanity for 62 million. Less than two weeks after the crypto entrepreneur Vignesh Sudarshan, aka Medikovin, launched people into the stratosphere, another crypto mogul, Andre Abodun, spearheaded Jeffrey. Well, what does this say? While Jeffrey's work was not accompanied by an NFT, the fact is the work, the work was purchased by someone who made their wealth in the crypto game. What does this mean? Um, a history lesson is again useful. Let's go back to May 15, 1990. That was the day the Japanese paper tycoon, Ryui Sayoto, shocked the art world by buying Vincent van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gade at Christie's in New York for what was then a whopping 82.5 million with fees. Back then, the highest paid work of, highest paid uh, on record for an artwork at auction in history. Later that same week, Satyoto was at it again, this time at Sotheby's, where he bought Renoir's Amoulin de la Galette for 70, 78.1 million, making it the second most expensive artwork ever sold to date. While these prices may seem tame by today's standards, they set off an era in the art market where blue chip modernist and pressioners canvases were gobbled up by mostly Japanese investors, flush with cash from a booming economy. The problem, it was a bubble. The key term in the whole talk. <laughs> At its peak, led by a strong yen against the US dollar, Japanese corporations were posting record profits by the mid-1980s. The Japanese banks incentivized growth by allowing borrowers with astronomically low interest rates, real estate ballooned, corporate and private landowners were taking out loans against their real estate assets, leading to a very leveraged economy. Uh, on paper, Japanese real estate at the time was worth four times all U.S. real estate combined, despite being 26 times smaller in actual land mass. Also at the time, land in Tokyo's Imperial Palace was worth more than the entire land mass of Canada. Driven by this influx of wealth, it is no surprise that Japan came to dominate the art market during this period. Uh, 
In February 1990, the Los Angeles Times reported that, and I quote, Japanese dealers and collectors are stopping up about 40 to 50 percent of total sales at London-based Christie's and Sotheby's auction houses. In some cases, dealers say, with little regard for quality or price. The good times would not last forever. Between late 1989 and August 1992, the Japanese stock market collapsed by nearly 60 percent. The country's real estate sector, once four times larger than that of the U.S., plummeted. Predictably, so did the art market. According to the LA Times, prices for Impressionist works had already been cut in half by January 1993. And, to quote the LA Times, a rash of bankruptcies by dealers had forced banks to take paintings in lieu of loan repayments. To continue on with the LA Times quote, coupled with long smoldering aftermath of the 1987 Wall Street crash, the resulting fire sales of Impressionist and modern work stoked an art market inferno that lasted well into the early 2000s. Which brings me back to NFTs. Uh, what is happening today in the NFT market is all, not altogether dissimilar from what happened in the 1980s when Japanese buying buyers were gobbling up everything under the sun. Like the art speculators who jumped in right before the 80s bubble imploded, crypto assets today are witnessing unprecedented growth, a big part of which can be attributed not to quality, whatever that means, but rather with the money amassed by cryptocurrency investors who have all gotten fabulously wealthy. Art is whatever, ultimately whatever you want it to be. The price someone is willing to pay for it is largely connected to interests and macroeconomic conditions, largely out of the control of any one person, whether it is the lofty price for a Van Gogh paid by a newly minted Japanese paper tycoon, or the mortal sin of paying millions for a JPEG anyone could just right click and save. The extraordinary conditions of this seem to follow uh, a logic that really is uh, more or less hodling, whaling, diamond handing, bag holding, shit coin, ICO. I don't know. I mean, we can go a bit into the terms shilling. Well, you know, I'm a master in that. So if you guys uh, want to get some of this. Uh, Do you have a PhD in shilling? I have a PhD, a PHS. <laughs> and, well, I guess that leads me to some of the, like, cultural ramifications of how this culture is developing and, uh, and moving forward. And there is certainly a, a, a lexicon that has developed around this new uh, cultural phenomenon in the 21st century. And I think it speaks a lot to what... Uh, Oh, this is a term I made up, yeah. Uh, agit drop refers to the intentional vigorous promongulate. I can't even pronounce these things I make up. Of crypto <laughs> propaganda. The term originated in the USSR, United Solidity Shill Republic, referred to popular media such as PFPs, which is profile picture, NFTs, one of ones, utility DAOs. Okay, you got that. And uh, speaking of show, please. I should have put my public wallet address on there, too. If I had a little cup, I would be going around for a couple of dirhams. But uh, that's it. Victorian, question. Why do you think, why do you think, um, you know, there, as a space, it, it does seem like it, it, it's invented its own language. And a lot of the language are acronyms. No, Certainly. and there's a sense, therefore, there's a very hot, sharp divide of being on the inside and being on the outside. How intentional do you think that is to exclude people rather than bring them in? I think that with any new movement, there tends to be a new language. Cubism invented a different perspective. Right. I think whenever you have different movements emerge, they will ultimately create words, images, different forms of communicating something that is a break from the past. And I think all of these acronyms, all of these things like that are emerging from this tend to also be correlated to uh, the online economy of memes and how to speak through images imbued with short snippets of text. And I think part of that, the new lexicon perhaps relates to the attention economy that we have, which is, uh, more or less divisible by the, the medium of the, the smartphone. So when we're now developing new languages for, for internet and for cyber, uh, excuse me, crypto blockchain projects, a lot of that tends to be influenced by the memes that we see, the, the visual culture that we consume, and becomes a self-referential uh, sort of 
codified system where then we're able to communicate, you know, uh, with a sort of tongue-in-cheek yeah. um, lexicon where we can understand each other and, the, and those who don't understand are left out. I mean, Dorian's giving a second part of this talk tomorrow, on, specifically on the meme economy, so please do come back to that. But my, my take would be that um, the most valuable resource in crypto has been earliness, mm -hmm. right? Being early to, the, uh, early to the space, but also early to the project, to be whitelisted, you know, like everything, the competitive edge is earliness. Mm. And one way you can guarantee that is by making sure the masses aren't, are way behind you, no? Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, there is, I think there's a strategic advantage to having a private language, right? Because in a sense, it alienates the most people. Mm. And those that, you, I mean, it's what Holly was saying about like you having to do the work. Mm. You no, know, like you do have to do work. Mm. It's not gonna kind of reveal itself to you. It's not gonna sort of prostrate itself to you just like that. Like you've got to put the work in, in order to get past that kind of chasm mm. that's alienating you. But once you, you know, and then you're inside. Mm -hmm. But, and then after that, I mean, actually the next session is, a, is about games and gamification, but this is such a huge part of it, no? Mm. And I think part of the game is very like aggressively alienating mm. the, the majority of, 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 but, of but, the but population. But so, so did data when data came around. You yeah, know? Yeah, so yeah. There, there is a certain, it's true, you, you develop a, a language and a, and a lexicon that is designed by virtue of its na the natural evolution of language and the way that Chomsky and all these people who are looking into like the evolution of language, it creates a system in which we're then able to form communities yeah. and then different political economies. And these things all relate to the language of crypto and relate to the language of blockchain and, and the communities and the subgenres that they form. So I think to, to more or less conclude, uh, I think in order to look deeply into this, there does need to be a, an emphasis on understanding the language, the terminology, the things you, the, the words and images and references used. And it's, it's a really important part, and I would encourage young people, uh, Esan, uh, if you're still here, but uh, to get into the, the whole language and meme economy and everything that revolves around crypto. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's fun, it's exciting, um, and uh, yeah. Great. So do come back for Dorian's uh, second uh, part of his uh, uh, presentations tomorrow afternoon. But for now, a round, a big uh, applause and thanks to Dorian.